Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. So today I'm welcoming back Margaret Kimberly to the show. Margaret Kimberly is an editor and senior columnist to the Black Agenda Report, which publishes news, commentary, and analysis from the black left. She is author of the book, Presidential, Black America and the Presidents, which is an eye-opening and very well-researched volume published by Steerforth Press in February 2020. I have a review of this you should read. I'll put the uh, link in the notes. She contributed to the anthology In Defense of Julian Assange, which includes essays by over three dozen other well-known figures, including Noam Chomsky, Daniel Ellsberg, and Matt Taibbi. Margaret is also the, on the coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace, which seeks to recapture and, and redevelop the historic anti-war, anti-imperialist, and pro-peace positions of the Black radical movement. So, Margaret, we uh, find ourselves in this position today where there's this election that just happened, and there's not a winner that's been declared yet, at least uh, not as far as I know. I just took an hour to drive here. <laughs> no, not quite. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and and uh, it looks like it's probably going to be hanging in the balance, you know, uh, for, for a while, you know. And um, yeah. there's uh, yesterday, uh, one of the things that happened was that Uh, Trump came out and he went through this long list of charges of here's all the different ways I'm being cheated, right? You know, Uh, Mm -hmm. which was ironic because, of course, it's his party, which has done a lot of vote suppression uh, over the last few years. So in response to his claims that corporate media has been clutching their pearls and saying he's attacking, quote, the integrity of the process and the sanctity of democracy, right? So Joe Biden (laughs) responded with, it's the will of the voters and not anything else that chooses the president of the United States. So as an historian of U.S. presidents, I'm wondering if you'd like to respond to that. Is it true that that it is the will of the voters and not anything else that chooses the president? <laughs> well, so who who do you get the chance to vote for? I mean, who decides before before uh, you get to vote in a primary or in a general election? So you get whoever it is they they cough up, and then you get to choose amongst those people after the one percent have decided who you're going to have the option to vote for. Right. And uh, so that's it. And with the electoral college, you could have a situation we had it in 2016 where the person who gets view- fewer votes actually gets to be president. So that's just not true. That's a, a lot of platitudes to to keep people uh, happy uh, or or keep them from complaining too much. But I, I wish the will of the voters is uh, what counted in this country, but it is not. Historically, the will of the voters has never really been the, at, at the forefront of, the, of it. No, no, it isn't. It's, uh, you know, people want all kinds of things that we're told we can't have. We can't have Medicare for all. We can't raise the minimum wage, although I thought it was funny. Uh, Trump won Florida, but a uh, voter referendum, they raised the minimum wage. So, uh, but we see these contradictory, some of these contradictory impulses, but most of the things that people need, we're always told by Republicans and by Democrats that we cannot have them. So uh, uh, when it comes to what we want, um, you know, there have been, this is something we can observe, and there have been studies that show even when uh, the person we vote for wins, we still don't get what we want. So the system is made to um, cater to the will of uh, powerful interest groups, mostly with, uh, with their money, and we get the leftovers. We're told all we can do is, um, that all they can do is nibble around the edges, and we should be happy with that, especially that's especially um, pronounced with Trump being in office. And uh, there's this mania to just, just get rid of Trump, just get him out. And any questions about once they chose Biden, if you pointed out, you know, I think he has a cognitive issue, people would get angry. If you raised uh, Kamala Harris's uh, history as a prosecutor and a jailer, people got mad at you because it was all about getting Trump out. 
So, uh, and that's the saddest thing to me. Now they have buy-in from people who ought to know better. I've been very concerned this whole time about this. Uh, we have to get Trump out and nothing else matters and we will vote for anyone but Trump, then it seems to me that that's just, that's just begging for disaster because not one single demand has been made of Biden, uh, you know, by, by, the, by the mainstream at all, you know, by, by anyone who counts. Mm-hmm. You know, there's been not a single... Usually, I mean, the way politics, you know, should work, obviously, should be like, hey, you're not going to get my vote unless you, you give me what I want <laughs> and you give, you know, but but that's not, but we, we've done none of that at all with this. And so it strikes me that if Biden goes in, uh, that there are uh, disasters, uh, other disasters waiting to befall us. Yes, absolutely. You know, things have been turned on their head in this country. People, the the voters get blamed if a party loses. The parties have no, especially the Democrats, they're not accountable for anything. Four years after Hillary Clinton raises a billion dollars but then couldn't manage to get 10,000 more votes in Michigan, it's Bernie Sanders' fault. It's the Green Party's fault. It's everybody's fault except theirs. And uh, the fact that that narrative has been accepted means that it's still happening now in 2020. So uh, what are we told? We can't make any demands. So rather than say, I'm going to withhold my support from you, Joe Biden, unless you can uh, agree to support the following things or some of these things, uh, so there can be a point of discussion and perhaps compromise, but we are told that we can't do that. And so we, and it's especially dangerous now because uh, I think there's going to be a collective sigh of relief that Trump is gone and uh, people are, uh, the, you know, the joke now is going to go back to brunch or saying everything's fine, the, you know, crazy orange-faced man isn't here, so there's nothing for me to pay attention to. Um, Biden will be able to get away with a lot. He can, has the potential of being a very dangerous president. Uh, foreign policy is a particular worry of mine. It's something that doesn't get attention, that most people uh, don't think about. Um, so I, I think he can get away with everything up to and perhaps including starting World War III and anything else. What are we already being told? Well, you can't go too far left. There are, because the uh, race is so close in Georgia, they're going to be runoffs for the Senate seats. And um, uh, already Nancy Pelosi says, you know, you can't start talking about Medicare for all or anything because we've got to save those seats. So instead of this outpouring, I mean, this huge, the biggest voter turnout in American history, instead of building on that and talking about how to uh, expand it, they're already contracting it. They already are saying that we have to minimize what we can possibly discuss. And that uh, puts us all in very grave danger. It certainly does. And I'm hoping that you might be able to say a little bit more about the foreign policy issues, because I agree that those don't get enough attention and that, uh, you know, there's kind of this incorrect assumption that the Democrats are less warlike than the Republicans, but this really hasn't been borne out, especially since uh, September 11th. Uh, and in some cases, you have Democratic politicians who are really um, speaking from the right of yeah. Trump or other Republicans <laughs> and being bellicose. I mean, maybe you could talk about some of the hot spots uh, or hot spot issues that we need to be um, concerned about. With the sure, we have. The well, first of all, Biden has always been one of the uh, biggest hawks in the Democratic Party. He was uh, supportive of the invasion of Iraq. Then he said, well, you know, we should just partition Iraq, which actually that's how the longer story, how Iraq came to be when the British partitioned those, those regions after World War I. Um, when uh, um, uh, Trump assassinated the Iranian general earlier this year, uh, what did, did the Democrats say that was something they would oppose? Nope. When uh, Trump uh, tried to overthrow the president, um, uh, elected president of Venezuela, what does happens when Juan Guaido, their uh, 
uh, usurper of choice comes to Washington, they all meet him. Trump meets him. Nancy Pelosi meets him. Everybody meets him and talks about he's the leader of democracy and the United States has the right to decide who runs Venezuela. Uh, Israel still uh, uh, looms very large. It's still the 900-pound gorilla in the room. Uh, Biden has always been a devoted uh, Zionist and is unlikely to do anything that Israel doesn't like. So out of one side of his mouth, he talks about uh, the U.S. going back into the uh, Iran nuclear deal that was a, a high point of uh, Obama-era diplomacy. But at the same time, we know the Israelis will do everything they can to keep that from happening. So those are, and of course, there's China. Um, this uh, And what did they say during the campaign? Uh, Trump and Biden, you know, had these contests about who disliked China more. No, I'll be tougher on China. No, I'll be tougher on China. Uh, Russia, the Russiagate fraud was perpetrated in order to make sure, partly, to make sure that there was no rapprochement between the two countries. So um, those are just some of the um, areas where uh, we should all be concerned because the Democrats are not less warlike than the Republicans. They have started wars on their own or they go along when Republicans start them. And and by the way, these sanctions are war by other means. They, The U.S. has killed 40,000 Venezuelans as a result of sanctions. People in Iran can't get medicine because of sanctions. Uh, Syria, the U.S. failed militarily to oust Assad. So they have chosen to uh, strangle that country with sanctions and make uh, create misery for people without any bullets or bombs. So why there are U.S. troops in Syria alongside Russian troops in Syria? And these are things that have not been discussed, but it's the area where the uh, president actually has more leeway than in domestic um, uh, issues. So uh, it's something that causes a lot of fear for me. Right, and Africa is also another place. I, I believe on a recent uh, Black Agenda Radio episode, I heard that the United States now has military agreements with or military personnel in nearly every country on the continent of Africa. Yeah, that's AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command, which came into existence at the tail end of uh uh, Bush's administration. Uh, people don't realize that the U.S. has uh, divided up the world under areas of control. There's a AFRICOM and a NORTHCOM and a SOUTHCOM and an INDO-PACCOM. And uh, so uh, these African nations are uh, militarily controlled by the U.S. And uh, this is something that creates a lot of problems for people on the continent. Obviously, they don't have their rights of sovereignty. And, and, that's, and it's not just the U.S. either. It is the U.S. working with uh, its NATO allies. Uh, someone sent me an email earlier today that under the guise of uh, fighting uh, uh, terrorists in Mali that France just bombed uh, the nation of Mali and uh, killed 50 people. But Mali is a hot spot because they overthrew Gaddafi in Libya. And these jihadist groups got their hands on uh, uh, Libyan uh, uh, military weapons. And that's been a problem since 2011. And a Democrat did that. So we also have to watch out for these wars that are um, where the U.S. uses proxies. And the lesson from Iraq was don't send U.S. troops. In, but that does not mean that the U.S. does not have other ways to create mayhem around the world. And uh, Black Alliance for Peace, that's one of the things we're get dedicated to, is ending um, AFRICOM, ending um, actually getting rid of all the foreign military bases that the U.S. has, eight, some 800 around the world. And part of the interest in Africa is elsewhere, but, but certainly in the um, technological age that we're in now is the, the many of the resources, as they call them, of the, of the region, uh, specifically a lot of resources that are needed for um, high-tech, uh, for, for making high-tech high tools like phones and, and computers. And I understand that there's uh, slave labor, and in some cases child slave labor, which is involved in the mining of some of these materials. Yes, uh, uh, the name's blanking on Coltan. Coltan is a mineral 
found in Central Africa and the Democratic Republic, Republic of the Congo. Uh, it has been the cause of great suffering, millions of deaths in the Congo, and coltan is used for all our electronics, cell phones, computers, etc. And whoever uh, controls it has access to this resource. But it is terrible. It is something that is just literally found in the dirt in Congo. If you have a shovel and a bucket, you dig in the dirt and you come up with coltan. But uh, so this is something that creates great instability. The wealth is not does not go to the people there. Um, and uh, it's the kind of thing where uh, that, uh, you know, actually is a, these resources are not a boon to many of these countries. Uh, the um, local uh, compradors are enriched. The U.S. and its uh, NATO allies get involved to make sure they can always access uh, these uh, resources and the end results are wars that create great misery for people there. So um, those are the things that barely ever make the news. You really have to be on the lookout and know which independent sources to um, to uh, uh, seek out so that you know anything about them. But these, you know, Obama retreads that who I'm sure Biden will want to bring back, the Susan Rices and the Samantha Powers, is they've, all of them were involved in uh, these schemes, which created a lot of death and, and uh, misery. And unfortunately, Biden will be unleashed to repeat that or create his, his own mayhem. Right, because this is one of the areas where the the, the ruling elite, you know, of, of the U.S. their their interests are their their interest in, in, in getting wealthy and in, in exploitation and, and in power. That that's 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 you know you could either call that nonpartisan or you could call that bipartisan. Uh, yes, it is. It's it's thoroughly bipartisan. There is a war party, and it's uh, um, Democrats and Republicans make it up. So. Um, it's, uh, you know, when foreign policy, there's a lot more consensus than there are differences. So even on Venezuela, the only criticism from Democrats is that Trump has failed to overthrow the elected president. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, fealty to Israel is bipartisan. And the attacks on China, this new Cold War, it's all bipartisan. So uh, the, I'm glad, you know, sometimes I'm glad I'm the age I am because I can remember when there were disagreements expressed uh, on foreign policy within the two parties. But at this stage of the, the crisis of capitalism, there's more uniformity than ever before on the U.S. trying to maintain its role as a hegemon without any opposition from anywhere else in the world. And um, that is not working out well. And we, you know, we have uh, China is um, uh, the uh, China's economy, by the way, is the only one thriving in the age of COVID. How about that? But uh, the response is to uh, encircle China militarily and to ratchet up the tensions between the two countries. Uh, and that's been, you know, the Bush team. Uh, so uh, uh, Trump a few days ago said, I'll never talk to Xi, Xi Jinping, the Chinese president. And Biden probably won't say those words, but that policy will probably be repeated. Right. Yeah, you know, I'm also old enough to remember when there were at least vocalized differences between the two parties. Is it? Is it? Um, do you think that it's uh, the 9/11 era has what has made the difference? Yes, I think that played a huge role. 9-11 uh, succeeded in silencing people. It succeeded in getting a consensus for interventions um, abroad. So it was a masterstroke of evil genius. Um, that is part of it. But uh, there is, uh, at the same time that uh, um, the United States seems to control so much of the world, it's also creating its own crises. So uh, overthrowing governments, intervening in Ukraine, all of these things bring China and Russia closer together. They have to be close in order to protect themselves. So China has deals with Iran to buy their oil and circumvent the sanctions. So we do have countries who are working together to try to circumvent this pressure that they are, um, that they are under. Um, 
but there as you know but as this continues there's less and less ability to speak out is what did george bush say you're either for us or against us and uh and that attitude has prevailed ever since uh september 11th which is now more than 20 years ago the forever wars against iraq the uh, the fact that troops are still in Afghanistan, and there's actually debate about whether you can discuss um, them uh, uh, being ever being uh, removed. So, uh, yes, that was the beginning of a um, uh, this this uh, road to hell, as uh, as I like to call it. But um, unfortunately, we have to we have to work hard and organize in order to get people knowledgeable enough to want to be involved and raise these issues with uh, Congress and the new president. Right, right. So you mentioned Ukraine in there, and I just wanted to bring up the point that there's been this, uh, it seems like uh, the reaction in, in sort of the liberals, among the liberals and the Democrats has been, oh, the, the Ukraine thing, that's just a, that's just a, um, that's just a campaign issue that Trump and the Republicans have been brought up and, oh, there's nothing to see there, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and they want to just dismiss it. And yet what happened in Ukraine, well, under Obama, right, was, was, was uh, a, a U.S.-led coup which installed right. actual literal neo-Nazis. Am I correct yes. about that? Mm-hmm. Yes, that, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what happened. Uh, the... the um, Ukraine was a country with great divisions. The U.S. and NATO came on, on came in on one side, uh, threw out the elected president, um, and brought in people, many of whom are card-carrying Nazis, Nazi sympathizers. Um, that's one of uh, uh, the that's part of Ukraine's history, especially Western Ukraine, where they um, uh, never accepted the. Uh, uh, Soviet control, and uh, in part as a reaction to that, they actually supported um, the Germans when they invaded the Soviet Union, and those folks oh. are, and that philosophy is still around. So um, that was, and of course, this antagonizes Russia for, to install a hostile government right on Russia's border. So it created, um, and and Ukraine now is a an economic basket case. It's the poorest country in Europe. They have a civil war. Uh, some Ukrainians hope to join the EU. And instead, Ukrainians are cheap labor for the rest of the continent. It was an absolute disaster. And, um, uh, you know, people, because we were told it was all about uh, 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 getting, you know, Putin's guy out and, you know, the president who was elected was some kind of tyrant and the neo-Nazis were some kind of freedom fighters, uh, people here just have the story completely backwards. But uh, it's an example of disasters created by Obama. And, the, you know, the intervention in Libya and Syria created these horrible refugee crises. When you see these stories about people fleeing the, across the Mediterranean to get to Europe, that's because of Barack Obama. That is completely him and his uh, administration and these horrible people who will pri- uh, probably uh, come back with uh, uh, Biden, and I'm I'm getting off the question a little bit, but it bothers me so much that Trump's manner was so distressing to people, but Obama's actual actions were not. Yes, yeah, I mean, we saw that over and over again, where uh, people were were simply unwilling to see Obama for who he was. And we're just seeing the, you know, basically plastic face that he was putting forward. And, you know, if Biden is the one who was installed next, he doesn't have that same power of personality. Uh, but I guess maybe he just won't even need it because, you know, uh, no. there'll be a certain class of people who will just be so relieved, you know. Yeah, Biden will have talk about Teflon. Biden will have more than any past president because he will be the face of uh, the end of Trump. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. 
And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Right, right. And it's, I noticed also that his record was, was barely discussed. Uh, and the corporate media yeah. during during this campaign, even though I, he was first elected to Congress in, I believe, 1972. So yep. it's not <laughs> it, it's not as though it's, it's not as though he doesn't have a record to look at. <laughs> but, but True, we, he does. So. <laughs> he has a very but long, we, very long record as a right winger, which is why he was chosen as Obama's running mate. Obama was perceived as a liberal and. It was felt that he had to have a conservative Democrat in order to, quote, unquote, balance the ticket and get more buy-in. But Biden was the leader against school busing, um, made many racist comments. Uh, I don't want my kids growing up in a racial jungle, among other things. Um, So he was the point person uh, 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 in favor of uh, fighting against school busing, which, which at the time was the remedy for school integration. Um, he has been a hawk. Uh, he's been on the wrong side of just about every issue. So, uh, but you're not, once, once they, you know, coalesced around him, we weren't supposed to bring, bring those things up. And, uh, so we're stuck with this man with a cognitive decline, with a horrible record. He chooses Kamala Harris, who has a horrible record as a prosecutor, who, as prosecutors all do, bragged about how often she put people in jail. Excuse me, but they are the face of, um, uh, the rescue from the horrible fascist Trump. Uh, only Trump is called a fascist, by the way. But everything we've talked about is fascism, mass incarceration is fascism, um, U.S. wars of uh, the interventions around the world uh, against uh, subverting the rights of other people in other countries, that's all fascism. But apparently if your manners are good enough, nobody will call it that. And the Patriot Act is fascism as well, and Biden also had a hand in that. He certainly did. I think every, I I think the, there was, I think, one vote against the Patriot Act, which was passed in the wake of September 11th, and we're still living with the uh, the encroachment on our civil liberties uh, by government. We're still under surveillance. Every the NSA, you know, it's so funny. They've uh, this latest, you know, attack on China. The Chinese Communist Party will have control of your information if you use TikTok or a Huawei phone or. The NSA has all our records, phone calls, emails, texts, everything, online, uh, social media, um, everything. If you've done it electronically, the NSA has the information. So uh, this um, uh, fascism has been going on for a long time, uh, and it did not start with Trump. And this idea that everything was okay before Trump is is ludicrous and scary to me. People act like there were no police killings until Trump got elected. There was no nothing, nothing bad until Trump got elected, and all we have to do is get rid of him, and the ship will be righted. Yeah, no, it's 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 been it's been honestly very very depressing. And and coming into this to this election, you know, I I've you know. Uh, you said uh, the other day on social media, oh, well, I don't have a dog in this fight, as I, as I believe what you said, you know, and, and yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, that's where I'm at, too. You know, I don't have a car in this race. I don't have a however you want to put it. It's just like, nah, like, like I didn't, I, I don't, uh, I'm not even registered to, to vote this time around, in part because I've lived and worked in several different states over the last couple of years, and the logistics of that are just difficult, but I wouldn't have voted for for, for 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 Biden, I just I, I couldn't have brought myself to that. I've been a lifelong. I didn't either. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I've been yeah, I've I've, I've been committed to you know, I've been a, a at least a, I've been a pacifist, you know, for since since I was a teenager. I remember telling off um, a, a military recruiter who called me on the on the phone. You know, so, so this, you. good this for you. Long, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And this goes back a long ways, you know, for 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 me, you know, and and so. So it's just it is it is honestly depressing to 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 look at this and be like wow okay that's the choice that's really no choice at all and then we see how they're decreasing our choices also by uh, um, uh, keeping third parties off. I noticed that the Green Party was only in thirty only on the ballot in thirty states this year, 
And yep. I seem to recall that, like, I helped with the Nader campaign in 2000. I believe that that year we were on nearly every state, you know. So yeah. they've been yeah. whittling away at that, too. Oh, sure. In 2016, the Greens were on the ballot in 43 or 44 states, but the Democrats made a concerted effort to get the Greens off their ballots. They've changed rules about ballot access. They used, uh, uh, you know, some uh, sleight of hand in places like Wisconsin. The vice presidential candidate, her, as she moved and had a different address on the filing papers, and they said that they kicked the Greens off. Um, uh, Pennsylvania, there was some sort of error with the cover sheet that kicked the Greens off. Here in New York, we got to vote for the Greens this time, but because they didn't, uh, Cuomo, uh, uh, our horrible governor, under the guise of uh, campaign finance reform, uh, passed this rule without the, the legislature weighing in, by the way, that um, parties have to get at least 2% of the vote in a presidential election year to be on the ballot. So the Greens and a couple others um, will not be on the ballot. We have to. It's going to be a Herculean effort to get them back on. The Greens were blamed for uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's loss, and part of that was cynicism. But part of that is, I think, punishment for people who dared to uh, want to do something different. And um, uh, you know, everything's been turned on its head. Uh, um, you know, where the people get blamed and not the political party. So, uh, you know, people uh, blame the Greens when they and, but didn't blame the Democrats, the ones who had the money and the power and the access and the support of the corporate media and still managed to lose. So, um, they're, you know, without a lot of work, the Greens will be on even fewer ballots next time uh, around. Yeah, I saw some depressingly low um, numbers of like, you know, 0.3%, you know, like like less than 1% in some of these states. And I'm like, wow, the the, the, the Democrat campaign against them, uh, you know, was, was successful. They really have been beating them back. And like, um, that's just, uh, it's just, I, I, I find myself incredibly disgusted by that, honestly. I'm, I'm sure you do too. <laughs> Yes, I do. I I find it disgusting um, and that there's so much buy-in. You know, here in New York, which is a so-called safe state, that safe state, that is to say where Biden had, I think, a 30-point lead, you can vote for whoever you want. Um, and once I realized how the Electoral College work, worked, even before I officially registered as a Green, I said, oh, I get to vote for whoever I want. So, uh, but And there were people who... Um, also uh, uh, followed that system and, and felt because they lived in New York, if they didn't like the Democrat, they didn't have to vote for him. This time, people I know who I know voted for Jill Stein last time, who said so, now they were like, Trump has to be repudiated. We have to run up the score. Even though my vote doesn't count, I want Trump to be humiliated, and so I can't um, uh, give my vote to uh, the Green Party this time. And uh, that was very disheartening to me that people who know better uh, would go along with that and and support these awful people. They are horrible in every way. Um, and they, you know, and they're such liars. What do they tell us all the time? Well, you have to vote for us because Supreme Court, Supreme Court, Supreme Court. They lost the Senate, so they can't. So they're in the same situation with uh, judicial uh, nominations. But uh, but they're not going to bring bring that up. The fact that uh, after all that talk, they couldn't, despite the fact that Biden wins with a record setting number uh, of uh, and we're assuming, of course, the counts will continue and trend in his favor, that that's not going to change. So we have people who ought to know better um, actually taking rights away from their fellow citizens, actually dimi actively diminishing democracy and doing it very, very happily. Right, right. So now, now more than ever, it's important, you know, the, the importance of like localized grassroots activism, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the um, you know, hashing things out in cities and in, and in counties and at, and, at the, and at the state level because there's just, you know, 
really no hope it seems at the at the at the at the federal level. There's really no there's really nowhere to get in there. You know, I don't think there's any any That's true. wiggle room. Mm-hmm. No, there isn't any talk of, you know, pushing Biden left or holding his feet to the fire. First of all, most people don't even mean that. They don't know how to do it. They're not really interested. It's just something they say to themselves to make themselves feel better. They know they're making a terrible compromise, not even a compromise, a capitulation. Um, and uh, that, But that's all that ever mattered. Uh, everybody wants to talk about the civil rights movement and the glory days of that. Well, you know, people in those days made demands. They made demands they knew politicians did not want to meet, and they made them anyway. So all the success came from that kind of determination, not um, uh, as a result of treating these these politicians like as if they're your friends. You get something from them when you treat them in an adversarial way. So absolutely we have to do things in a ground-up way. And sometimes we can't forget, you know, the local races, state uh, decisions may have more impact over our lives than what happens in Washington anyway. So whether it's... um, And I also think that electoral success comes after the movement success. So we've gotten it backwards. So absolutely, I think it was always true. It's even more true now that it is um, organizing for those issues that are important to us that are going to make the difference. And there's definitely some hopeful things that we can see uh, along those lines this time around. You mentioned already the $15 an hour uh, minimum wage uh, that passed in Florida, which I thought mm-hmm. was pretty amazing. Uh, also amazing was um, cannabis being legalized in South Dakota, of all places. <laughs> you know, I, I, I grew up adjacent to South Dakota and Nebraska, and I can tell you that's a shocker. <laughs> like, <laughs> really? <laughs> well, you know what's funny? It seems like every time people have the ability to vote uh, about marijuana, they always vote to legalize it. And no matter where in the country you are, there seems to be this consensus. Uh, I think Biden would have won on Tuesday night if he'd gotten behind legalizing marijuana, frankly. Yeah, but this just just got brought up is that neither neither of the major parties, you know, supports that, you know. And and yet I think down at at this point, it's now it's now definitely a minimum of states that don't have either recreational or medical. It's down to like 10 or something. I mean, it's just like. And most of those holdouts are, are are in the old Confederacy. There, you know, I mean, it's like uh, it's this is now a mainstream thing for cannabis to be to be legal. Arizona actually passed it so that it's uh, legal recreational there. So you now have legal recreational marijuana in a block of western states there: Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, and Arizona, where you can basically drive around with a dime bag on your dashboard, and no one can say boo to you. You know. <laughs> I love that image. Yes, it's uh, most people don't smoke when they're driving. Um, yeah, it's right. uh, it's very interesting to me. We can't get it passed in New York because of our awful governor Cuomo. Uh, that was mm-hmm. one of the things they couldn't agree on. New Jersey uh, passed a recreational uh, uh, law on Tuesday, also. But uh, yeah, it's something that, um, and I don't know why they don't do it. It cuts across regional lines, as you were just saying, states that are solidly red, solidly blue. It's something everybody wants. But uh, uh, the Democrats, I think sometimes they, you know, they think they're doing something that will uh, uh, antagonize uh, voters when it's just the opposite. It's something that people actually want. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to uh, turn uh, to uh, your column that you just wrote this week, uh, Black People Lose in 2020 was the, was the title. And uh, you brought up something here, which I think we should always come back to. Um, you said there's another factor at work here. This is a deeply racist country, and the Make America Great Again theme still resonates for millions of people. They, like Trump, precisely believe he is a true believer in white supremacist thought and policy. The term white supremacy should not be misunderstood. The men in pickup trucks carrying AR-15 weapons are the public face of this belief system, but they are not the only adherents. Men who wear suits and ties and their wives, daughters, and sisters are just as likely to want a wall on the border with Mexico and are comforted in the knowledge that someone who agrees with them is in the White House. Many of these people are not public with their opinions because Trump supporters are as demonized as their president. 
They don't want to be the face of racism, fascism, patriarchy, and incompetence. They, they may not see themselves as white supremacists, but they are, and they vote with those interests in mind. So yeah, that challenge absolutely. is still here regardless. It is. It is. It's. Um, I mean, we've so, we, we saw it in 2016 when Trump was elected. Uh, that's why he was elected. He made it clear he was going to put the interests of white people first. And that appealed to white men. To well, first of all, most uh, white people do vote for the Republican. That's not unusual. But he got a lot more votes than he was expected to because he was very clear about that. And he got more votes this time than he got the last time. He did apparently lose some points with white men, but gained some with white women. Gained some Latino votes. Gained even a few black votes. Um, but uh, it, it is whiteness that is um, determining how people um, align themselves political, politically. And it's something that people have been in denial about. Uh, you know, you could have been in denial about it before November 2016, but nobody should have any excuse to be uh, confused about it since since then, I still hear people whining. I can't believe he won. Who would want him to win? I can't believe it. Now I'm like, listen, you don't have to understand it, but you'd better accept the fact that when he puts, um, he separates families at the border, people, there are millions of people who are happy about that. When he says, I'm building the wall, people are happy about that. When he t um, uh, speaks well of the the white supremacists that people I identify as such, and says, uh, what did he say in Charlottesville? They're good people on both sides. Uh, when he defended the uh, white teenager who killed people in Kenosha, when he ordered federal uh, these federal troops to to kill um, uh, what is the man's name? Bino Reinold, who in uh, Oregon. They basically didn't even try to arrest him. There are millions of people who are in favor of that and who agree with him. And this was the first time that in their lifetimes that anybody was able to run for president and clearly enunciate what they believe, too. So that's what when people say um, he says what's on his mind, um, what they mean is he says what's on their minds. And it doesn't even mm -hmm. matter if he um, worsens a pandemic and thousands of people die. People can live in their own alternate reality. But there shouldn't be any more confusion. Uh, uh, maybe people can lament it if they want. But there, it is very, very clear how deeply racist the country is. We had uh, this weekend, all over the country, but here in New York, uh, just north of New York City, Trump supporters had this uh, caravan of cars stopping traffic on uh, the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge. It's now the Cuomo Bridge, but I refuse to call it that. Uh, and other hmm. places around the country. And state troopers who just stood by and let them do it. Uh, you can clearly see the state troopers in the video. So no one was pulled over for, you know, speeding or stopping or honking their horn or anything else that cops do when they want to catch somebody. So um, it's very clear that that sentiment is quite prevalent uh, around the country. And the only question to me is someone uh, pointed out to me, uh, pointed out that um, – uh, some of these people were kept under control because Trump was in the White House. And once he's out of the White House, they will not feel any constraints and may, in fact, feel emboldened. So the Civil War people were expecting and the Proud Boys would stop people at the polls and all of these things. So these things of this kind may actually happen, more are more likely to happen with Trump gone than with, than with Trump in office. Right, and then I look at I also look at the uprising of the summer and all of the young people who were involved in that, and um, and, and the demographics of that were incredibly di incredibly diverse, you know, and lots of white people uh, being willing to 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 uh, take to follow black leadership, and I'm like, well, is it possible that that this is a a demographic situation that if the United States is actually able to hold itself together as a nation, uh, will 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 eventually change just because the younger people aren't 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 as bad. Do you think there's anything to that? 
Well, we, you know, we shouldn't act like the Proud Boys don't have young people, too. So uh, partly right. But um, uh, I, I think the, the uh, protest movement this uh, past summer did show. I, I think it was the first time uh, that Black Lives Matter protests attracted so many uh, under that umbrella, umbrella of the rallying cry, Black Lives Matter, attracted so many white people. Uh, and I think it was a reaction. It was discussed at, uh, directed at Trump. Um, the fact that uh, of, about COVID, about all the suffering created about, by the COVID uh, economic disaster, I think all of those things came together um, to um, uh, create this uh, interracial movement uh, for the first time in a long time. But uh, so, I, and I think that's what um, added to the uh, the voter turnout. People who didn't bother in years past. Uh, thought they had to come out. There are enough people repulsed by Donald Trump to uh, come to the polls, and apparently uh, 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 slightly enough to um, to out uh, outweigh the additional support he got over over last time. So there is that is where the optimism should be that there is a consensus, although it's generally not expressed in our electoral results. There is a consensus about what people want. People want a better country. People want more uh, equity, want more justice. But um, uh, we have a political party, and by this I mean the Democrats, who are determined to get those people's votes without carrying out the things those, those people really want to see. Right, right. And they've, they've been called, rightly so, the, the, the graveyard of social movements, you know. Because they'll they'll take the they'll they'll take the um, the energy and the rhetoric you know et cetera of of these different movements and and sort of make a paper doll out of it you know and then and sure then so you have the Nancy, energy Nancy goes Nancy out Pelosi. of it yeah so Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and others wear kenta cloth and you know bend their knee and it just looks stupid to me they you know they got the message that uh, this movement was out there, but it's uh, all too often it's performative. Um, and uh, that's what we have to work on. We have to make sure it's not just something in name only. It's not uh, Fortune 500 companies issuing uh, diversity and inclusion statements or you can't watch Gone with the Wind anymore or, you know, um, you know, there's this new name, BIPOC. I didn't ask for a new name. I don't recall anybody protesting under the banner of I need a new name, but uh, that's what you got anyhow. So uh, that is the difficult thing, that these movements can be co-opted. Uh, you even had police taking a knee, uh, trying to silence people and keep them from protesting. So that's something we always have to be, uh, we have to be careful about because, that is where the movements go to die, and we have to keep these people. Even if you want to still be a Democrat, you have to keep them at arm's length. You have to um, withhold your support until they do something you want them to do, uh, because uh, without that, we get more performance. We get uh, dead movements. Right. So, so at this moment of right here, where where it's uncertain who it is that's going to be living in the White House, you know, um, come January. Uh, really, when it comes to the majority of issues that matter and things that need to change, uh, there's there's really no reason to wait to see who that person is going to be, that their work just needs to happen. Yeah, and it needs to happen even more because if uh, Biden being the president, I just I believe he's going to be very very dangerous if uh, he doesn't get pushback, if uh, there isn't a, a serious committed effort to oppose him. Uh, it's going to be even more important with him in office, I think, than with Trump. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would I would love to see a a, a no honeymoon hashtag uh, go viral. As Absolutely. <laughs> people people need to hit him with demands like now. Um, and mm -hmm. he needs to, I would love to see. I don't know. There are homeless encampments all over the country. Something is one of many things that isn't acknowledged that uh, is not mentioned. 
Uh, but um, the people who are out of work, who are desperate in this this terrible year, but uh, they and who weren't addressed, whose needs weren't addressed, they have to come out. They've got to come out in force. That's our only hope, uh, or else they're already looking to make excuses about they don't control the Senate and you can't say too much and whatever and whatever. Um, the demands have to be immediate. They've got to be consistent, and um, they have to be persistent. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little more about uh, the Black Alliance for Peace. Sure, Black Alliance for Peace, blackallianceforpeace.com, uh, is dedicated to reviving the black radical tradition that prevailed over um, most of uh, history until quite recently. We uh, talk, just talked about AFRICOM, but uh, as the name says, we are a black-led uh, movement and, and we are dedicated to uh, uh, opposing imperialist structures, be it, be it AFRICOM, uh, the foreign military bases, the militarization of the police here, um, the uh, interventions that the U.S. undertakes with its uh, with its allies, we are uh, and fighting the and and bringing first of all making clear the connections that you can't have nice things if the military budget eats up um, if military spending eats up sixty percent of uh, the discretionary budget, then you can't have health care, housing, education, and and so on, as long as that is true. So, and we are building citywide alliances. We are, um, we have a group here in New York, in Baltimore, in, uh, oh my God, I hate making a list, I'm forgetting people already, in the Bay Area, in Philadelphia, and uh, um, other places so that uh, we can come up with an organ organizing structure um, that will um, work on all of those issues that we have been talking about. And those people who, who get it already, who already get that we need to, this system needs to go. It has to be torn up root and branch. And um, uh, so that all of us, those of us who see it, can reach out to those who uh, may not, quite be there yet, but who know that they cannot accept uh, being happy because Joe Biden is uh, the one in the White House instead of Donald Trump. Right, right, right. And, and I, would, I would also want to put in a, a big plug for uh, the, the Black Agenda Radio podcast, which uh, is definitely my, my own personal favorite uh, podcast. I, I'm currently uh, in Oregon right now doing working on a, on a cannabis farm. And so a lot of that work is like, uh, uh, um, uh, it, it's it's you're, you're sitting there doing the same thing for hours, and so 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 podcasts become a big part of your life, and um, and really that's that's my very favorite one because the the guests that um, you have on there uh, are just come from so many different so many different backgrounds. You have academics on there, you have activists mm -hmm. on there. Um, the, uh, Glenn Ford is is really one of my favorite interviewers. He does such a great job just putting yes, exactly enough words out there to, to get something back. And every time I listen to that show, I, I, I just come away being like, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And <laughs> well, I, I do that too. It's a funny thing. Glenn, you know, uh, I have to thank him for getting such great people to come on, but blackagendareport.com, we have our podcast, we have commentary, we have articles, we link to other articles. We have a book forum. We have poet in residence. So uh, it is um, obviously my favorite website. But uh, yeah, we have to use the internet while we while we still have it, and um, uh, get out this information that the corporate media is not um, uh, not going to uh, to touch. It's very important that um, that we have these outlets. And yes, I learn things too. I learn things from Black Agenda Report, uh, from my colleagues, and sometimes from uh, pieces we link to from other folks. So, I, anybody who considers themselves on the left should be a reader of BlackAgendaReport.com. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. 
so uh, I, I think this we, we talked for about an hour. That, that's that, that's a good amount of time. I'm glad that we didn't get into the, all the horse race stuff. Everyone else is obsessing no. on that right now. Uh, really, yes. nice to just focus <laughs> on on you know because because really there's more that won't change than will change uh, even if Biden gets in. I think. I think so too, and uh, you're you're absolutely right. It's useless and stressful, frankly, to worry about the vote count in, uh, you know, uh, Las Vegas or Atlanta or you know or Tucson. So <laughs> it's ultimately not very very useful. But uh, I think we've talked about the bigger issues that are confronting us. And I, on the one hand, I'm glad that people are so involved, and everybody knows about 270 electoral votes. Um, but um, the, that that uh, desire to be informed can't stop when the vote count does. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.